We've got a tiny G CNC controller. We've got some pneumatic cylinders. We've got some NEMA 23 stepper motors. And we've got some awesome hardware like these ball screws. Folks, let's build a bigger and better DIY CNC machine. Welcome to another episode of NYC CNC. It was amazing to see the success and interest in the DIY CNC machine that we built just a few months ago. And the emphasis there was on just how inexpensive and just how easy it is with the Arduino, with the G-Shield, and some really inexpensive hardware. I love that machine. I think the only one mistake I made, which we discussed in the comments on that video, was it would have been a little bit more rigid. Uh, we were using this type of rail and, and bearing if I had used two of these, and that would have given it some more stability. But nevertheless, I think it proved the point that, that what a phenomenal, fun project and easy to get into. This really totally different. We're going to use the Tiny G Shield, which is more powerful, more responsive. We're going to have uh, hopefully the limit switches and just more control because I want this machine, I want this thing machine to cook. And we're going to use NEMA 23 steppers, hopefully just bigger, able to deliver again more speed. But the big difference is really going to be the hardware. And it's not cheap, just period. There's, it's not cheap. I think one of the things I'm hoping that we'll see change in the next five, you know, five years or sooner is a more uh, a access at our level, whatever you want to call that, the, your DIY or home user to this kind of stuff. Because right now, buying linear rails, buying the ball screws and all the hardware for it, I think is overwhelming. There's too many choices. It's not clear what's what. And it's expensive. You know, these, um, all the links are, are going to be in the video description below, but you know, you're looking at, you know, Things like the ball screw set here, $150. These linear rails, two or $300 total. So it's not inexpensive. You're going to have, you know, I, I don't know yet, but you know, easily $1,000 in a little machine like that. So what's it for, and why, are we, why do we have pneumatic cylinders? Well, the thought for this machine for me right now is I want a better way to engrave. I engrave on the Tormach. It works. Um, and if you want to engrave on CNC's, you can even use really cool spring-loaded tools like this from 2L-Link that compensate for minor variations and chip load and lots of things like that that are they're not complicated, but you can have a long discussion about it. Um, but at the end of the day, the Tormach's just not a great machine uh, for engraving. It's only a 5,000 RPM spindle, and I would engrave with a 20,000 RPM spindle if I had it. But more so, I've got a great machine that's really capable, that's tied up doing things like engraving, and it's, it's slow. Um, or the trade-off is you wear out tools more quickly. And we do, um, we do, I don't say a lot of engraving, but you know, we want to engrave these hitch covers where you can see this one hasn't been painted yet, so you see the weld marks, but in grooves on, on the, in that mild steel. And we like to engrave our rimfire steel targets with our logo uh, right here, and it looks nice. So the thought was, hey, I have no problem investing in the little machine and hopefully we can have a nice and easy setup where you can just drop a fixture plate on there that lines up these different parts, hit go, and we're going to use this, for now, um, cheapo pen engraver. Now, I, I will readily admit this will probably be the first thing we upgrade um, if the whole thing works, but this is sort of the weak spot. But this was super inexpensive and I figured it's a place to start and we'll, we'll try experiment with it later. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about what ball screws and linear ways uh, or linear rails are, and then let's look at the SolidWorks model and figure out the plane for how we're going to build this thing. So what we've got here is a ball screw with a ball nut, and then a linear rail with a linear rail uh, bearing block. Let's talk about the ball screw real quick. These things are really cool. Um, you can buy various grades of the various precisions and grindings, but we're not going to get into that. What matters is how this thing works, and it works because there's a series of recirculating balls inside of this nut. It's also what makes it expensive. Um, if that doesn't make sense, take a look at this video, and you can actually see there are small ball bearings, not dissimilar from what you would see in a regular bearing that we're all a little bit more familiar with that rotates around like you would have in your, uh, the wheel of your car, tire of your car. Um, and they provide a number of things, including low friction, mechanical advantage, you know, transfer of power, um, accuracy, preload. There's just a huge reason why these things are, are really, really cool, and they're really fun to play with. To buy these, 
right now, I actually recommend eBay, and, and, here's, and they're from China, and here's why. I think you're gonna be best off buying this as a kit. You're gonna hit the ball screw with the ball nut and then the end blocks, and you really want that because if you look, this is going to come with a kit, which is gonna have a ball screw that's been turned down and then threaded um, for a nut and then thread or then turned further down for a, um, oh, for a coupler that's gonna to mate to your stepper. So it really just, you know, uh, I don't even think it costs that much more, if any, and you're really gonna save yourself from headaches. So um, you can see here's the exact one that I purchased on eBay. And again, just if you don't buy the kit, you'll have to spend some time making sure you get all the parts that made up. Okay, now let's talk about linear rails. These guys are also not inexpensive, but I'm actually really happy. I found these from Automation Overstock, and as you can see here, the bearing block is $36, and then this rail is 500 millimeters, and that's $36. So each one of these, 72 or 144 for the pair. That's actually really inexpensive. One of the reasons these are inexpensive is they are only tapped from the back side. There's no through holes for countersunk screws. That makes it a little trickier to work with, um, but we, uh, we're gonna, I'll show you how we take care of that in, in SolidWorks. These things are also amazing. The idea here, incredibly low friction. You can move them around really fast, and they just don't twist. They are solid as a rock, which is really cool. How do those work? Let's take a closer look. We've got this um, bearing that we haven't put on yet. Let's zoom in and look at the balls as we slide this uh, spacer out. So you can actually see the balls moving inside that spacer. And we just carefully do, that's all I'm gonna do. You can see the balls right there. So literally they recirculate through that. How cool is that? So there's the beginning of our rail. Let's go ahead and slide this guy on here. You just use the rail push the spacer out. That way uh, you shouldn't lose any of the balls, like so. Perfect, so let's take a look at what all this means with a model. Now, don't laugh, but I at first thought I would actually consider just designing this in my head and just sort of whipping it up. Absolutely needed to model it. So here is the SolidWorks model. And if you take a look, you'll see we've got this base plate that was actually sitting on the table a minute ago with the uh, linear rail and ball screw on it. And then we are fastening those linear rails to little uh, pieces of one inch aluminum angle on the sides. That'll let us tap into these and fasten them because they're only, again, threaded on the underside. What we have to pay attention to is keeping these two rails pretty darn parallel because otherwise the machine would bind as it traveled along this axis. You see we've got the ball screw under there and that's another really important reason you have to model this up is you'll see it matters how you mate the uh, gantry to the ball screw nut because you want to make sure you try to maximize travel of the machine and actually sort of a lesson I learned is I should have bought a slightly longer ball screw than I did because you can see we're only going to have machine travel from, well, and you can see the pen will sit in this uh, piece here, from there to uh, right about there, so right at the edge of the machine or so. Not the end of the world for right now, but something for you to consider if you're going to design one of these on your own. The uh, y-axis, a piece you see here, I actually purchased uh, from eBay because it was, a, I thought, a good price, and I thought, well, let's just try that and see. I was trying to make this as um, little machine as I can, because not everybody has a machine shop and can make all these parts on their own. So this is a 12 and a half, you see here, 12.75 inch slide. They call it for a 3D printer. Um, it's slightly lower quality than the linear rail stuff, but uh, well, we're gonna see how it works and, and see how it goes. So that's one option is something sort of half pre-made. So. Um, that's pretty straightforward. You can see the one stepper here for the um, x-axis and then the other, the y-axis stepper would be there. And then for the z, or the plunge, what we've got is the hole here that's not filled will be where the pen mounts. And then these two guys here are those little bimba pneumatic cylinders. So when you want to engage the machine to engrave, you'll do two things. You'll plunge those down with a pneumatic solenoid that I don't have yet, but we'll cover in the next episode. 
and then you'll also turn on air to the engraving pen that'll uh, cause it to be marking the metal and then the machine will start to move. So in theory, pretty simple, right? Um, so next up for me, I need to make some of these parts, whip them up, not too many things to do, and then we're going to start putting it together. Again, as I mentioned, the thought here with the alignment of the angle brackets to keep them parallel is to use four dowel pins and have those precisely located. I hope that's enough. Uh, the machine will be, it'll be flexible enough that there'll be some give to it, but I, I don't want it to be um, I want to. I don't want to fight the wrong battle. I want to have it as accurate as practically possible. The other thing we could do is, is mount them on there and then actually machine them square. But that's kind of a pain in the butt. I, I'd really rather not have to do that. Uh, otherwise, I think it's going to be hopefully smooth sailing. So let's. Uh, I'm going to go whip up some parts here. We'll be back next week for the next episode. Hope you guys have enjoyed. If you have, folks, thumbs up, comments below. I'm really excited for this build. The t I've heard great things about the Tiny G board. It's supposed to be really powerful, responsive. Like I said, adding limit switches and making this into like a little turnkey machine for a very low amount of money. You can have a very precise machine. It's like a second or third op type of machine. And uh, I think I'll build more of these if they work as well as they do. This machine is also, I think, going to be totally rigid enough for some sort of a spindle if you want to actually have a milling or machining op instead of the pneumatic engraving. That's the hope, at least. We'll find out next week. Take care, folks. Stay tuned. See you soon.